Secretary General of Save the Children here in Denmark, and thank you for being here. Right here where we are sitting is where we uh, stacked all the life jackets when they arrived, uh, and we had to build up the Ai Weiwei piece uh, on, on our facade here. And none of us uh, installing it uh, has been as close to Lesbos as, uh, as Rafat. But what really hurt us when we were walking around in all these life vests were that some of them had small Arabic poems. Uh, small, some of them uh, were still dirty after uh, the trips. And some of them were, I, I brought one of them. A lot of them were, were this size and even smaller down to, to baby size. And I think that is, um, if, you, if you don't um, have the refugee crisis close every day, for us who worked here at that time, it really marked um, or made an impression that, that these children, these families uh, suddenly became human. But could you explain us what is the situation for, for the children, uh, the refugee children right now in, in the world and in Europe? I can do that. Um, thanks, Michael. But, but let me just start by, um, first of all, thanking, thanking Rafat for your tremendous um, uh, sort of courage, compassion, uh, and commitment. I know that touched, that touched all of us. And I mean, I know your organization is called something else, but that is truly humanity in action. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot. Um, it, it, it certainly gives me a lot of, a lot of hope um, for the future. I'll, I'll take a small detour before answering your question, Michael, um, because I actually want to start by just sharing a little bit of, of, of statistics. Again, I know we've had some of it, but, but, just to, but just to set the scene a little bit. If we take all the numbers, if we take all the refugees that we have in the world, and they're scattered around a number of countries, if we lump all of them together, they currently represent the 20th largest country in the world. The 20th largest country in the world. It's also the fastest growing population in the world. And although, they've, although we've seen a slight sort of flattening of this development last year, if they keep growing at a percentage of between eight and 10%, and it might, that might very well happen because we are not able to bring conflicts and wars to an end on the contrary because our international community, as Moens was saying, is in a great sort of um, state of paralysis. By 2030, if this trend continues, the refugee country, if you like, will be the fifth largest country in the world. It will also be the youngest country in the world because it will be the country with most children and young people. That was six seconds. A refugee child, a refugee, sorry, a child was just uprooted in those six seconds. Every six seconds, a child is forced to flee from violence, from persecution, or from great deprivation. Children with no stake in any conflict or in any war, it is not their war. Yet they are the greatest victims. The smallest suffer the most. Many of these children, as I said, are on the move. Majority move within their country, as we've heard. A number of them move outside their country. There's a lot of char characteristics for children who are forced to flee. Most of them are denied, are denied some of their basic rights. They suffer from great forms of abuse and violence. They are denied their right to education. They very often fall in the hands of smugglers and traffickers um, who, um, who put them through all kinds, of, all kinds of sort of damaging treatment in terms of child labor, prostitution and other forms of violence. Um, and very often these children separate from their families. Very often they travel alone, they stay alone, and as such are some of the most vulnerable, some of the most fragile uh, refugees and often they have no choice but to embark upon really dangerous journeys journeys over land or journeys over water 
some, but really only a minority, travel to Europe. Some of them wore this vest. What's, what's, uh, I think what's, what's, and that's, that's, it's emotional for me to see this vest. I've seen a number of these life jackets. I've seen teddy bears in the waters in Europe. I've seen suitcases. I've seen uh, belongings of children. We don't know if these children actually made it. We don't know if these children of the child that wore this vest actually made it alive to Lesbos or whether that child died. So that vest carries the story. Many of the children that made it, unfortunately it is the majority that still make it, uh, they each have a story. But we cannot forget that every day two children, so two human beings at the age of zero to 18 die in the Mediterranean. They die en route, they die on the way to safety in Europe. We can save them, but leaders of Europe are so intent upon, upon protecting borders, protecting European borders, rather than protecting lives. And what we often... <laughs> what we often tend to forget behind these statistics and I was a victim of using statistics again. We tend to use neutral descriptions. We call them migrants, or we call them refugees, but they are human beings. They are children. They're real children with names like, like my two daughters, Ellen and April, like your children. They were brought into this world with love. They were swept in clothes, and they've been in their mother's arms Mothers and fathers have cried of joy. They've smelled this beautiful smell that only babies have, which I know that many of you will recognize. Fathers and mothers who've dreamt, dreamt big dreams of what would happen to these children, what they would become. The same dream like all parents, like myself, and like all of you have dreamt of on behalf of your children. The dream of them growing up and realizing their full potential. The dream of them becoming su successful. The dream of them becoming loving parents themselves. This dream for too many children around the world gets lost in the waves of the Mediterranean or in other zones of wars because there's no responsible leadership and what we also tend to forget that it's exactly the dream of those parents that let them to that let them flee these parents with their children only decided to flee knowing that this trip was dangerous we've heard it from Rafat they decide to flee only because the alternative is worse So they send their children, sometimes alone, 90% of the children that currently reach the shores of Europe safely are unaccompanied. They travel on their own. They don't travel with their parents. Imagine the existential nervousness of the parent who's brought this child into this world and that lets this child go, lets this ch child travel, knowing what the dangers are. But they do it because the alternative is worse. Because the prospects of deprivation, of war and conflict is worse. And yet we allow children with names, children with potential, and children to resource, uh, with, uh, with resources and with dreams, sorry, to die at the doorstep of Europe before their life has really started. These are the children with names, children that carried this vest.
I know you and Save the Children work with this conflict and this terrible situation every day. Um, what what kind of solutions do you see to to this? Uh, if you are as frustrated as I am when I hear uh, the stories told here today, what can be done? Is it only money that we can send, or can we help in other ways? It's true. This is this is the largest. This is the largest refugee operation for for Save the Children. We are the largest uh, independent um, aid agency in in the world. Um, so what can we do? And, and I'll, I'll actually put this to you, the most important thing you can do, and which in many ways, I, I, you know, this is, it, it, this is the true value of Ai Weiwei's art piece in my world, is that what I would say to you is don't forget. There's a real risk, we're already seeing this now, we're into the sixth, years of, the sixth year of the conflict. There's a real risk that the conflict in Syria becomes trivial, and it, it becomes every day. We're already seeing news coverage is going down. We're already seeing that, that resources um, going towards um, that, um, the Syrian refugee population, whether it's inside Syria or neighboring countries, is declining. Currently, only about 30 to 35 percent of the humanitarian needs, and these are basic humanitarian needs, um, are only being met. So, so don't let, don't forget these children. They are children just like, just like your own, with names, with dreams, with potential. I think that's my, that's my first sort of plea to all of you. And it's a plea that you will have to s sort of um, uh, commit to for probably another 11 years, because currently, with the paralysis that we are seeing, in, in, the, in the UN Security Council, it takes about 17 years for a conflict to be stopped. So if Syria stays within that statistic, we will see a war that will continue for another 10 years. And add to that Yemen, South Sudan, Central African Republic, Somalia, and what have you. You need to ensure that this is not forgotten, that politicians, policy makers, do not forget the refugee children, that they do not, that they continue to care for the plight of children. And then I, coming from an NGO, I have to say this, but I, but I actually mean it, don't stop supporting the organizations. Some of us are represented on stage tonight that actually save lives, that protect children and adults, and that help educate, educate them. We bring hope to these children. And by supporting agencies like ours that work inside Syria, often risking lives, risking our own lives, we actually make miracles. By, by supporting organizations like ours, you don't change the course of the conflict, but you can certainly change the course of a life. And that's worth it. So keep doing that. Keep holding your government to account for constantly providing resources to help these people. And hold them to account more than anything to try and bring an end to these atrocities that happen in the countries I just mentioned. Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Central African Republic. And also ensure that you hold them to account for sticking to the current regime of human rights and humanitarian law that we have. There are a lot of voices, even in this country, over the last couple of years that we should probably revise the international humanitarian law. We should change the refugee convention because uh, it's not convenient for us any longer. We cannot let the scaffolding of human rights fall just because it's inconvenient for the rich countries to have too many people in need knocking on our door. And then I think, lastly, 
and this is just a sort of echo on my own points earlier, we have to be patient. The conflict in Syria, and those of you that, that follow it will know this, um, will not be solved tomorrow. There are no quick fixes to what is a historical refugee crisis that we're seeing, not just in Syria, but in some of the other countries. We have not had so many humans on the move since the Second World War that we currently have. So there are no quick fixes. There are only long-term and really comprehensive responses and strategies. This will cost resources, as Moen said. It will take many years, and it will require all of us you as individuals, institutions like the UN, NGOs, the private sector, and all of the governments to come behind this. There's no doubt in my mind that we, as a, as a world, as a society of, of, of resourceful world sort of citizens, we will need to get behind the idea of a Marshall Plan for Syria of another comprehensive support package for Syria, just as Europe benefited from a Marshall Plan after the Second World War. The story of Europe, the story of Japan after the 1940s, the story of Korea after the 1950s, is a story of humanity in action. It's a story of a rich parts of the world catering for the plight of people in need, children, as adults. That's the kind of courageous, comprehensive and long-term plan that we need to come up with, that you need to ask politicians to come up with, to resource and to execute in order to give children back their, ch their childhood and in order to bring some peace into this morass that we're currently in. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas, and uh, thank you, all of you, once again, for enlightening.